Good morning. Um, my name is Jun Gu Ri. At, uh, I'm assistant professor of uh, organization studies at Hanyang University, which is uh, located in their, uh, their east part of their uh, Seoul metropolitan area. Yeah, so uh, this paper is uh, uh, part of the project that I have been working with Professor Lim, uh, Hyun, uh, Hyunjin Lim, um, uh, that examined their uh, mobile telecom sector in the context of East Asia. And uh, Professor Lim, actually, as you imagine, that there were being in a uh, co-author of the paper and at the same time a member of Prestige National Academy of Science actually is, is a bit of difficult uh, difficult task, so he uh, he have to uh, he has to uh, leave for the uh, meeting. Uh, so, uh, for, so he will miss the, this presentation, unfortunately. Uh, but he will come back later in the during the lunch times. And some of the work at the initial stages are expected to publish this soon, including the paper in their uh, compliance booklet, uh, which is forthcoming in their uh, journal of contemporary Asia. Uh, today, I will present some of the findings from the project with some uh, recent figures, and their, but their, their main story is uh, remain the same in their paper and uh, their uh, conference book. And in the meanwhile, I touch on the briefly on the issue of how to integrate the idea of the governance and the diver, uh, convergence and divergence of capitalism and increasingly fragmented, fragmented across national production, notably global value chain. I think that is the connection to their the, the previous presentation by Gary. Uh, compared to uh, many other presentations yesterday and today, I will take little, uh, very little about the institutional stories, but more about the market and commercial uh, dynamics. And obviously, institutions are very, uh, really important to understand their uh, market dynamics. But at this stage, our studies focus on the understanding the uh, more the commercial dynamics, leaving the institutional comparison as a task for the next stage. So here are the questions that have been driving, uh, driving our overall project. The how does globalization affect the industrial development in East Asia, which is the critical, the uh, classic question uh, since the, like the late 1990s. How does the fragmented production and shifting end market uh, to the global south in the global value chain actually shape the country's development path? And there are East Asian countries' path converging, diversing, or coibarbing. To answer this question, uh, we look at the sector or the value chain level, which is different from their user, like the institutional diversity of uh, the variety of capitalism analysis, which is most focused on the country level and their uh, political and political economic institution. But we are more uh, look at the sector or value chain level to see the interconnection of different socio-economic system through the process of turning design and ideas and concept and raw material into a finished products. That's the definition of global value chain, by the way. Uh, we use the case of mobile telecom sector where the East Asia has been very strong uh, in the global market for, uh, for uh, several decades. And we look at the four East Asian countries. There is China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And we examine the variations across the country, and in particular in the case of China, within country variation, which we found very interesting. The globalization is defined by increased flow of goods, capital, and people. And on, that's the one hand. And the other hand, it involves the increase of mutual awareness among regions, countries, and firms. And globalization makes the lives of people from different parts of the world interconnected and interlinked. But at the same time, we select and change our course of action in the awareness of their existence of others, whether they are the, uh, uh, we are cooperate with or the compete with. In this way, we interact with each other, whether our social, social economic system eventually converged or diverged, which is uh, uh, still under debate. Whether different forms of capitalism were converged or diverged is the question about the outcome, whether actually they are converged or diverged. Each outcome can come through the various different processes of how different capitalisms and institutions interact with each other. For example, we may, they may compete, or one system actually displaces another, or they may coexist in a somewhat complementary manner. And I would argue that we need to think about the process of interaction between the capitalism as much as the outcome. So, and in our studies, we particularly how the firms and global value chains as an actor or the mediator play a role in shaping these processes. 
The global value chain refers to fragmented and decentralized cross-national production system, and the contemporary industrial structure, as many uh, literature suggested, is largely characterized by the slicing of the value chain, and the production process is split it into the narrow tasks, and they are sent to different locations and countries and firms through the offshoring and outsourcing. And inputs are processed multiple times at a different country, leading to the growing trade of intermediate goods instead of final goods. And this decentralized production system is governed or driven by the multinational companies or lead firms who are increasingly located in the buyer side of their chain, which is the downstream of the value chain. And the amount of value captured each part of the chain is uneven, uneven. and as Tan Shi, founder of Acer, a well-known Taiwan, Taiwanese electronic firm, famously described this phenomenon called the smile curve, so that their, their, the value added is the highest at their, at their, uh, their, their uh, pre-production stage and their uh, post-production stage. Actually, actually, the middle stream of the value chain assembly, like the local assembly, is actually uh, less valued uh, compared to their, the other two part. That's the, so it looks like the smile uh, 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 pace, so it is called the smile curve. Let's look at more about the global value chain using their now famous example of Apple iPhone. Uh, on the back of every iPhone, uh, it says the design by Apple in California and assembled in China. But when it comes to supply networks that make iPhone exist, there are more uh, than their California and China. Actually, you can, uh, you can look at their uh, global supply network of the iPhone 4. Actually, you can see their US and Europe and Asia and their, uh, their Southeast Asia. Look, let's look at more closely. When the iPhone 4 is shipped from the assembly factory in Sunjun, China, uh, it cost about $194. But actually, assembly cost for Foxconn, which is the Taiwanese-based contract manufacturers, amounts to just $6.50. And overwhelming majority of the value added comes from Korea and other uh, developed country. And these multinational component suppliers actually capture the much of the value, as you can see. And then, then the Apple, of course, Actually, as the lead form of the chain gets the biggest chunk of their profits. And what this means is that the first, there are multiple entry points for the country or firms pursuing participation in the global value chain, whether it is the front end of the value chain or the middle end of the value chain or the, the downstream of the value chain. The secondly, um, uh, the, the value that can be captured uh, from each node of the value chain actually quite different, it is not equal, so your uh, payoff will be quite different depending on what part of the value chain you are participated in. Uh, this development in the global, global economy demands more sophisticated frameworks on the countries or firms' integration to end industrial development in the global economy. And there is more than just the dichotomy of input substitution or export-oriented in uh, industrialization. Above all, we need to take into account how the countries or the firms are positioned in a different node of the value chain. Some may specialize as suppliers or in parts and component segments, while others may extend their chain to the branding and marketing. So when that dimension is combined with the different degree of how much they focus on the competing in the global market, which I call the global market orientation, we can have at least four different types of uh, global integration. So, the global suppliers, high global market orientation, focused on their, uh, their supply side of their uh, parts and component, global brands, focusing on the post-production, branding and marketing on the global market, and there is equivalent to their, uh, their uh, and the local market. Uh, this is complicated picture of their uh, mobile telecom value chain, but uh, let me skip this part. I, I think it's, uh, I need more time to uh, talk about the, the latter part of their uh, presentation. Okay, so. Let's go to their uh, story about the East Asia. Uh, so, there are uh, these other uh, some of the figures about their uh, mobile phone export and their mobile phone subscribers. So, this is the production side, this is consumption side, and there, this is their uh, China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And uh, there are some commonality, but there is a significant difference as well. There, are these four countries combined uh, account for more than 50 percent of the world mobile phone export. And, uh, but, well, 47% of that, actually, uh, the world exports is, comes from China. 
But you can look at the Japan. Actually, they their export actually declined. Is the is the what well, is their billion and million? And now is their Japan share is just uh, less than a one percent. And uh, so that's the quite uh, uh, interesting story. On the consumption side, this mobile phone market is quite saturated in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. So you can see that there, well, everyone almost in the in this market, everyone has their mobile phone. Sometimes more than one, okay, and then but the Chinese market is still still fast growing. And in terms of the actual number of mobile phone subscribers, yeah, look at this, um, one billion, more than one point two billion, and actually, well, actually outside of the three of the uh, their East Asian markets. So, in terms of their actual market size, it is uh, almost incomparable. And, but also there is a significant difference in the domestic market condition. This is the market share of the local brand versus foreign brand in 2006 and 2011 in each of the four uh, East Asian market. And you can see that there in Korea and Japan, majority of market actually dominated by the local brand, even though that their, their dominance actually uh, have been lessened because partly, uh, mostly uh, because of their, uh, their, uh, their invade of their kind of iPhone. And there, you can see that there, there, the China and uh, Taiwan is very different pictures. And uh, Taiwan, uh, they are dominated by the foreign brands. But the interesting thing is that you can see that the chi in China, this is the only country among four that actually the local brand expand their market share, which is suggesting the their increasing load of their, uh, their uh, Chinese local brand. And this is the East Asian uh, mobile telecom firms and the, and the ranking in the world uh, market, uh, uh, their uh, world market, as you can see, that there is a separate storyline. There's the rise of Korean firms, Samsung uh, uh, mostly, and the fail or the drop out of their uh, Japan Japanese firms. Actually, they drop out of their ranks, and now there is no Japanese firm on the top ten list. And then there is the occasional rise of their uh, Taiwanese firms, BenQ and HTC, but they are their uh, lives is short lived, and then. There is, a, again, the rise of the Chinese uh, brand. What they are actually, their market share is largely comes from the uh, Chinese domestic market because of the sheer size of the market, but they're expanding their uh, foreign uh, share uh, gradually. Uh, so let's look at the divergent development paths in the East Asia. So what well, this is is just like the based on our uh, qualitative and quantitative assessment of their well, position of their uh, key firms uh, in each of the four East Asian countries in, in the mobile phone market. As you can see, that the Taiwan and Korea is very high in the global market orientation, but there is slightly in a different position, although the Korea has some kind of like the function here. And then the Japan, Japan is very strong in their, uh, their, their high value added part, but their brands is, uh, is largely drop out of the global lace, and they're, they're now in the mostly like the domestic hall. Uh, domestic brand. And interesting thing is that China covers quite a large part of this domain. And uh, China is moving all the directions and uh, they uh, develop kind of like the multi pass development paths, which is quite interesting uh, uh, to us. So let's uh, quickly look at the uh, story of Korea and uh, Taiwan. Their Korea is uh, the Korean firms, mostly like the Samsung and LG, is so strong in brand products and global marketing and branding, but they are highly vertical integrated productions. So this is the uh, Samsung Galaxy S4, bit of material estimates, and uh, well, the display processor memory and manufacturing, and 61% of these uh, material costs actually covered by the Samsung and its affiliate companies, so that there is a highly uh, vertically integrated and internalized structure. And the Taiwan is very different stories focused on the OEM and ODM, so it's outsourcing contract uh, manufacturers and component supplies, and they gradually upgraded to the largest scale uh, uh, EMS electronic manufacturing service, and they're now their well, they're, they're Honhai, the Foxconn, which is their assembler of their uh, Apple iPhone as the world reading EMS. This is the 2014 world top 10 EMS providers. According to the industrial source, you can see that three, key, uh, three uh, Taiwanese firm, no Korean firm, no Japanese firm, and there is rise of Chinese firms. So they are the new kids in their EMS market. 
And the Japan story is quite interesting. Actually, Japan's brands failed, uh, failed in their uh, foreign market and actually retreated by the 2005, retreated from the foreign market, and they troubled in their entering in the Japanese market. The more important thing is that actually their declining output at home, and this is the domestic shipment in Japan, mobile phone. As you can see, that after the uh, financial crisis, global financial crisis, actually the ship, the 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 shipment is uh, quite uh, dramatically uh, declined because of their like their offshore outsourcing. But at the same time, okay, at the same time their. Uh, the shrinking demands in the, in the local market. The final story is the Chinese multi-patch development. So China covers many part of their, their, their landscapes and because of the, they, they, they have large domestic market and they try to develop their own technological standards. That is the TDS, C, CDMA, this is the 3G standards. TD, uh, LTE, this is the uh, 5G standard and they develop their own standards, which is quite similar to the Japanese experience, uh, although it is not so much successful uh, and, uh, recently. And then there is a global market-oriented local branded manufacturer like the Lenovo, uh, Huawei, and GTE, which is quite follow the trajectory of the Samsung and LG and try to imitate their, their global branding strategy. And then there is a strong presence in the part production and contract manufacturing, like the Foxcom has major production in China, and there most of their employee actually are in China. And then there's so the, the even though that the uh, Chinese uh, uh, firms capability in the part production and R and D is still weak, but. Uh, because of the presence of the multinational, actually there is uh, increasing uh, exports from uh, mobile phone parts from China. And the final thing is, the interesting thing is that, that they're exporting to the low-end overseas market. That's the white box phone. It's unbranded phone. You can find in many Chinese unbranded phone from China, and in China also, and many emerging and developing countries. That's the new market, actually. No Taiwanese, no Korean, no Japanese firms actually pay, have paid attention to. So let's, uh, this, I'll skip the, uh, the, the first three and then I'll just look at the uh, load of the southern market just for one minute. And so this is the China, uh, China's mobile phone experts uh, compared to, uh, compared between the 2007 and 2013. This, uh, the, the country name colored in lead is the uh, non-OECD country. So you can see that there, well, Hong Kong is there, has a special relationship with China in terms of trade. And India, Singapore just in the 2007, and there is uh, India, Mexico, and Russian Federation. And, but once you look at the Hong Kong story, which is uh, Hong Kong is a kind of gateway of their, their uh, Chinese export, there is a more emerging and developing countries that the names popped up. In 2007, these are that. And there now, well, there is a significant export, uh, import from China, but at the same time, India, UAE, Russia, Mexico, and Indonesia, and the other emerging uh, economy becomes the part of their, uh, China's uh, end market. So that's the kind of, I think, interesting development in their uh, China's uh, mobile phone industry. So just quickly, uh, conclusion, well, we need more sophisticated frameworks needed for the develop, uh, the, to understand the development paths in the global value chain beyond the well, ISI or the EOI or just success and failure. It's not just a complete success or some complete failure. It is just like success in certain degree in a some segment of the value chain. And the multiple trajectory in China's industrial development. The question is whether this kind of like the multiplicity or the coexistence of the different model, whether it is a transient, what's a, so it is a transitional or there is a defining characteristic of the Chinese industrial development compared, well, the distinctive from their uh, uh, other East Asian uh, experience. And the final question is that when the Chinese actually well, expand their, their industrial capability in the mobile phone sector in a all different position, and that creates some kind of competition with other uh, East Asian countries. And the question is whether these East Asian, uh, the, the East Asian countries in the regional value chain, they are competing or complementary. And they're, well, if they are co evolve in a certain manner, and how actually the researchers can capture co evolving dynamics. And where the source of this kind of like the national divergence uh, in terms of the global integration, well, that's another question uh, where we actually uh, uh, address the uh, topic in their paper, but we'll continue to do the research. Thank you for your attention.